Did you have to first get your first writing assignment or script sale on your own and then you got represented? Or were you lucky enough to get somebody on your corner early on? Excellent question. And I have the magic answer. The magic answer is you get a lawyer. You get an entertainment lawyer because you're going to need an entertainment lawyer. And an entertainment lawyer isn't there is no screening process like the agent and the manager are going to look at you and scrutinize you and read your writing samples and rightly so. And if you're not a name and if you're just starting out, you have to really blow their socks off. An entertainment lawyer won't do any of those things. You're just going to hire them and they're going to work for you, uh, you know, project by project. But they know agents and managers. And so they're going to say, you know, great, I can do your deals and I can do the little simple option agreements because you're a baby writer and all you're going to get is option agreements. The likelihood of selling a million dollar spec screenplay is astronomical. And if it happens, you're going to get an agent and manager the next hour. So you get an entertainment lawyer and your lawyer's impressed by you and he's going to start hooking you up with these people. And that's exactly what happened to me. How do you think the industry can help to discover the future of storytellers that are not necessarily privileged like you and I are to live in the United States? How do they get those shots? You better be sure when you're writing in a language that's not your first language, you've mastered it completely. Otherwise, it's going to sound translated, and that's not a screenplay. So it's one thing to talk about unproduced writers in the U.S., who absolutely need more venues for their material to get seen, as opposed to this tortuous game of Russian roulette where you're trying to approach agents, but you can't get an agent unless you've got the sale and you can't get a sale without an agent. Screenwriting master's degree is completely useless. All you have to do is download the American Film Institute's top 100 screenplays of all time, read them, and you've saved your money and you've gotten an education in how to write screenplays. Download all the scripts that get nominated. Download the box office hits. I'm sure there is a formula there, right? That's why they got green light, because Hollywood is formula. <laughs> it is formula. It absolutely is. But of course, the uh, challenge and the creative uh, aspect of it is how do you take something that is a formula and make it feel fresh and new and break the formula and re restructure it and use it to your advantage in a surprising way? That's the challenge. I hope that there will be more people like yourself and me that they will create groups where they can foster um, those new voices, where they can show them how to do to have use final draft or yeah. read save the cat by Blake Snyder, who is yeah. like, right, which is a Bible. I got to plug my own favorite one. Uh, when I was at American University, one of our textbooks was Vicki King's How to Write a Screenplay in 31 Days. I, I recognize the quality of rewriting and rewriting and rewriting, but Part of getting hired in the uh, film business is being fast and delivering within a very specific amount of time. Now, again, I don't work in television, but I think television is particularly fast. But even in features, you got to be able to hit your targets and turn the thing around quickly. People appreciate speed. And um, that book taught me how to write fast. Uh, I think a lot of my career has come out of the fact that I can turn things around quickly. And there is another book that I love, which is uh, Your Screenplay Sucks, 100 Ways to Make It Great. And it basically, for the newbie writers, go over the 100 most obvious mistakes that people make. The next project I at least worked on is a horror movie again uh, called The Pope's Exorcist with Russell Crowe that's coming out on April 7th, which is based on the true story of Father Gabriel Amorth, who was the Vatican's in-house exorcist for 35 years co-starring Franco Nero as the Pope. Even in horror, I hope, although I don't watch a lot of it, there's got to be some character work going in there, right? Uh, it, it, the only way horror becomes relatable and frightening and engaging is if you care about the characters and you relate and recognize the characters. Character is plot. So the idea is that if you're following a character under a set of circumstances that provide the theme, the story is going to be around that person's experiences. Is it still applicable what they say that when you work with a studio, you have to get like a hundred sets of notes from a hundred different executives and it's like changing every two minutes? Here's the quid pro quo of studio versus indie. Studio... In studio world, they will be breathing down your neck. I like to say the eye of Sauron would be upon you at any given time. In the indie world, 
you have total, mostly total freedom to do whatever you want. The alter, the, however, the um, alternative is the studio is going to make your movie go theatrical and your movie is going to be seen and your movie is going to get a good streaming deal and your movie is going to get all these other perks and good at publicity and all that kind of stuff. In the independent world, uh, there is a pretty good chance your movie will never be seen by anyone ever. Yeah. So those are the two aspects that you got to keep in mind. You certainly are a treat. You've been a treat in this podcast. I absolutely loved having you on. Thank you all for listening. Thank you, Evan, for coming on my show.